Again, Happy Easter, everyone. And we're very happy that uh, there are a number of people viewing from home. Uh, and, um, you know, if you have a cup of coffee or an espresso, you know, I'm not going to fault you, right? The, the, the fast doesn't uh, necessarily apply. Uh, you're not receiving communion. If, however, you have a mimosa or a Bloody Mary, that's pushing the envelope. So I would say leave that to Easter brunch. <laughs> On Good Friday evening, I watched the film Life is Beautiful, La Vita e Bella, uh, starring and directed by the irrepressible and ebullient uh, Robert, Roberto Benigni. Uh, and so just a quick uh, description of the film. Uh, if you've not seen it, see it. It's fantastic. The writing, direction, cinematography, uh, the acting. Uh, so it takes place in World War II. That's the setting in, uh, in Italy as uh, fascism is rising uh, and uh, starting to take Italy. And Guido, who is uh, Benini's character, uh, is a, an Italian Jew. And his son is half Jewish. Uh, he marries this beautiful Italian uh, woman. And uh, what happens is they end up being taken uh, to a concentration camp, uh, his son and Guido together. And he's deeply in love. They're deeply in love, the, the spouses, and she wants to go with them. And she travels as well. And really at the heart of the story uh, is Guido's attempt to do anything to go to lengths to instill hope in his young son and in his wife as well. And with his young son often sheltering his son from the horror by changing his perspective of reality itself. And uh, at the end, uh, well, I won't do the spoiler. If you've not seen it, I'll just stop there. On this Easter Sunday, friends, most Christians and indeed our global humanity face challenging realities as a result of the pandemic that has ravaged health, social life, jobs, the economy, and more. The fact that I'm preaching to a near empty church as the Archbishop is doing at the cathedral and Pope Francis has done earlier today in Rome encapsulates this surreal moment. As challenging as these times are, and we all feel it, right? You all feel it. We're human. Christians know that crisis and opportunity for change and restoration are part of the same reality, just as the cross and the empty tomb are part of the same mystery, the Paschal mystery of Christ. Last Easter was the happiest day of my priesthood, speaking personally. I felt a transcendent joy, a Christian joy and happiness. Lent last year had been a rich time of prayer, and the fruit of the journey from the desert to the empty tomb was happiness and joy. That rich prayer has continued throughout the ensuing months, a gift for which I am thankful. This is not my emotion today. Rather, today, on Easter Sunday 2020, in this surreal moment, I have, and I trust that you do as well, a deep sense of hope, Christian hope. Hope rooted in a God who made heaven and earth ex nihilo, out of nothing. Hope in a God who became incarnate out of love for us. Hope in a God who will save us, as Pope Francis said in Rome a couple of weeks ago, he is in the same boat with us. He will restore us from the ashes. What's my cause for hope? Last night, two catechumens who came into the church were baptized. Today, four candidates for confirmation and full communion in the church. My hope is in our brothers and sisters, our citizens, fellow Americans, who are doing extraordinary acts of virtue and valor in serving our fellow Americans who are suffering. Why? Because they see and they feel the, the dignity of the human person. They know it to be true. 
so they put their lives on the line. God did not change the perception of reality as Guido did for his young son or shield his children from the horror. He entered into it. He took it upon himself and redeemed it through the unfathomable depth of his love, poured out for us from the cross, poured out for us to transform reality itself, to transform the fate of humanity. In rising Jesus, Jesus has raised us all to a new hope. Pope Benedict XVI in his great encyclical on Christian hope, Space Salvi, says the one who has hope sees clearly. I would say, I would add, the one who has hope sees in the darkness. The one who has hope sees around the corner and into the future. That's what Christian hope is. Indeed, this hope gives us Christians perspective. We can see the horizon. It gives us peace amidst suffering and challenges. On Easter evening, Jesus comes through the doors of the upper room. Pastor Rick Warren was saying last night on television, very insightful comment, uh, reading the signs of the times. He said, perhaps more than any other Easter, this Easter we are like those Christian disciples. We are, many of us are, are in our houses feeling locked and trapped. Fear and uncertainty abound, right? This is our existential reality. And just like them, Christ comes through the doors of our home and he is present to you today on Easter Sunday, the risen Christ. And the word that he speaks is peace. One word, peace. English doesn't do it justice. The word in Hebrew is shalom right, which means so much more. It means harmony, completeness. Uh, for, for Jews, it means both hello and goodbye. It means all is well, all is reconciled, all is forgiven, a deep peace. Julian of Norwich put it centuries ago, a medieval mystic, she said, all shall be well, all manner of thing shall be well. This is the peace of Jesus Christ. This is the peace that gives us hope on this Easter Sunday. So let's contrast Mary Magdalene and John with Peter and Thomas. Mary Magdalene and John are rare, even among the saints. I would say they remind me of St. Joan of Arc or St. Agnes or Therese of Lisieux. They come to faith early, they're mystics, they're steadfast, and there's no record of them falling away. They weren't born without original sin like Mary, but they're pretty darn close. Peter and Thomas, Augustine, and many others, not like them, right? Maybe more like us. For Peter, right, his journey is fits and starts. It's not perfect. And same with, Th with Thomas as well. Uh, Peter has moments of great leadership and enlightenment, and then he backslides, often in the same exchange with Christ. He denies Christ three times. But I remember uh, a talk that Susan Stabile gave a number of years ago on that beautiful encounter on the seashore uh, in the Easter season, where Christ invites Peter into restoration and into the deep sense of forgiveness. And I remember Susan said, the reality is that Jesus does not give up on any of us. That's how deep his love and mercy are. And what about Thomas? Thomas also experiences it. And the thing that connects these two figures who maybe remind us more of ourselves is it's in the proximity to the risen Christ that they come to a place of deep and humble faith in their proximity to Christ on the seashore. And with Thomas in the Indian tradition, and I heard this from Jim Stegbauer uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in, the, in India they have the tradition that when Thomas puts his hand into the side of the risen Christ, what 
what moves him to ex exclaim, my Lord and my God, is that he can feel the beating heart of Jesus, the risen Christ. It's in that proximity. And for us as well, Christ, uh, friends in Christ, in our proximity to the risen Christ, it's where we grow. Our wills are strengthened, our minds are enlightened, and our hearts are expanded. Our world and our collective humanity is at a crossroads. We are bruised and broken. We are in crisis. And yes, this crisis presents an opportunity for a more authentic and compassionate and faith-filled people, a redeemed humanity. But as Pope Francis says so beautifully, it happens when we choose to be with God who chose to be with us. It happens when we grasp the outstretched hand of the risen Christ who wants to raise us. It does not happen apart from God and apart from Christ. This is our faith. A number of months ago, uh, last summer, I chose to end our faith formation year, and I'm going to do a little uh, podcast, 30 minutes, because I think that's the attention span, including for me. And, and the, the title of it is The Wounded American Culture. I had been telling friends for months that, that I really sensed that, that our culture, that where, where we were and what we were experiencing was not tenable, not sustainable. Too much polarization, uh, too many people moving uh, away from God, uh, too much incivility, uh, too much ignoring, as Pope Francis would say, those on the margins, those that we seek to throw away. This is not the way of God. Something had to give. And as Christians, we know, as Catholics, certainly we know, that God does not cause these things. But my goodness, we also know that he is there to clean up the pieces, to raise us to new life, to show us a better way. Our wise Pope at St. Peter, in that darkened uh, St. Peter's Square, said something very important a couple of weeks ago. He said, now is the moment for choosing what matters and what passes away? What is necessary and what is not? Paul says to the Colossians today to seek what is above, that which is of God and transcendent, beauty, love, mercy, goodness, and peace, all of God, all of what is above and what can be rooted here below as well. So what if we as Christians, and I'm just about done here, what if we as Christians, see when you're on sabbatical for three months, you want to load it all up because I've been talking to myself mostly. Uh, so what if Christians practiced our faith and integrated the love of God into our lives the way that Americans are practicing social distancing? Uh, the, the health experts have been surprised. I don't think the numbers were overblown. They've been surprised at the numbers moving down, right? We're Americans. We don't like to be told what to do. I certainly don't, uh, probably more than most. Uh, this is who we are. They didn't bet that we would, we would comply with this. But you know why we are? Because lives are on the line. Lives are on the line. So what if Christians took that same zeal and concern for the faith that Americans are for life, we would transform the world. So finally, when I think of an image of, of peace, that deep shalom, you know, I, I think of the, the three months I had in Candelia, the really peaceful place where I was. Uh, I think of northwestern Wisconsin or a beautiful uh, icon that I pray with every morning here in Minneapolis of Christ in glory. And at the bottom it says, behold, I make all things new. But as St. Thomas Merton says, that solitude and peace we will never fully grasp in this life, maybe even for the mystics. But what is also true is we can experience that peace in a deep and real way. It's not an image. The thing that comes closest to me for that peace that is our Christian hope, that all is well, all manner of thing is well, uh, is, a, is, a, is a song, a piece of music. It's uh, 
sheep may safely graze by Johann Sebastian Bach, and, and uh, Jacob is going gonna, is gonna to play it at the offertory after the confirmation. Listen to the beautiful piece. That's the, that's the sense. That's what we experience on Easter Sunday. The truth that God has raised his son, Jesus Christ. The tomb is empty, and for all of us, his dear children, new life awaits us.